Hey guys, it's me, Pirate Cynical Clown. I mean, Mirdrovers, Mandrovers are the entire Wikipedia page about quantum electrodynamic Lando Powers, the latter probably being the one I'm recognizing the most. Yeah, uh, I might have lied about the title because if you're one of my peers, it's certain that I've already taken my metaphorically comically large spoon and thrown it deep down into your digestive tract with a description that is the crazy shit ever. Yay, I love installing stuff on uh, outdated Nintendo firmware that isn't supported anywhere. Yay! Uh, hello guys, it's me, the Guck here. Uh, I'm here to replace that uh, guy from before named Weirdoverse, Windroners, whatever the hell you want to call him, to uh, tell a little thing about KKHTA. Now you may be wondering, what is that? Well, KKHTA, which is short for Koichi Komeji's Heartthrowing Adventure, is a psychological horror Toho-based series made by a man who goes by the alias of Sintaku Ubune, with a very, very, very unique style that adds up to the absurdity of the series. From my point of view, even if you haven't really interacted with Toho, looking up what means what on the internet serves a lot of justice on understanding specific locations or character details, so I heavily recommend it to watch this on your own to its fullest, since, oh man, it's a real trip, marathon even, Dakar rally if you will, an absolute trip to the moon and back on foot, the eternal cycle of life and death. You get the point. And that's coming from a dude who only played the first two Windows era games, so I was going into it kinda blind, really. Part 1. Koishi Goes Fishing. Part 2 title card. Oh, wait. Give me a minute. There we go. To be more precise, Koishi, the gal without self-awareness from hit game Toho Subterranean Animism, who has the power to manipulate unconsciousness, wakes up and contemplates what to do. After looking at the calendar, note the date, and through absurd analogical thinking. She tells her sister, Satori, not to be confused with Satori species, which both of them are, that she is going to a body of water to catch a fish, for dinner to feast upon. Before departing, Koishi picks up her hat, which is detrimental to her being, and promises her sister to return before dark. Koishi arrives at the lake and comes to a sudden realization that she needs a fishing rod to fish, because fishing with her own hand seems kinda wrong. Koishi has a mind-numbing conundrum where to get said fishing rod and opens a book Satori gave her, in which it is stated that there's a building nearby called the Scarlet Devil Mansion. Koishi asserts herself before the mansion, and as she is about to enter it, she's stopped by Hong Mei Ling, the gatekeeper. She turns Koishi back where she came from as she is from the Chiridin, in other words, Palace of Earth Spirits, who is one of the inhabitants, aka Ro- oh, Yo, Mr. White, I can't even pronounce half this shit, yo! Oku, aka Ryuji Uchisusho, tried to take over the world. Koishi, while putting up with Mei Ling's order, lies about a UFO flying in the sky and tries to climb over the gate using the moment she had created for herself. Mei Ling hits Koishi like Scrat from the first installment of Ice Age using Divine Punishment, knocking her off the gate. Mei Ling tells Koishi to back off once again or she'll get hit more. Koishi rebutes, stating that Mei Ling will be the one going to be hit. Whilst Mei Ling doubts Koishi's strength given that Mei Ling is masculine and Koishi has a childish appearance, Koishi disappears and pulls an elaborate Saul Goodman ruse, pranking Mei Ling in the process and getting throat deep down to the bone. Here's a funny observation right here for you. Koishi, at the beginning of this part, thinks it's wrong to fish with her own hands, doesn't think it's wrong murder without an afterthought. I tell you man, what a double standard. Koishi excuses herself and goes through the gate as if nothing had happened. Later, the scene dims. A character whom is revealed to be Flandia walks next to Mei Ling to wake her up. For reference, Mei Ling is known to be a bit of a sleeper. After Flandia's fruitless efforts to wake her up, she sets a goal for herself to avenge her. Her, her, um, uh... As Koishi makes her way inside the Scarlet Devil Mansion, she asks the maid of the mansion, Sakuya, what color her Bugatti is. I'm kidding, she actually asks if she can give her a fishing rod. Sakuya agrees, purely so that she goes away faster. As Sakuya was about to lead Koishi to the cellar where the rod was, Koakuma, the assistant of the mansion's library, rushes in to inform her that Mei Ling has had a minor inconvenience regarding part 2, 
that may or may not affect her health to a greater level. And if she isn't taken to Iente, which is basically Tohu Universe's hospital, she just might meet religious figures of the afterlife. Maybe a bit of God, maybe a bit of Buddha in there, you never know, man. It's like a gacha um, game, determining which God you will meet specifically. Anyway, Koishi confesses that it was her deed, and as Flandere overhears this over a wall, fires a crimson colored Kamehameha towards her, burning her hat like an average student cooking anything in my dorm kitchen. Flashing and out a picture of cold chicken. As the drama between two heats up to quark glue on plasma levels of insanity, Sakuya takes it upon herself to transport Meiling to Eniente, whilst Koakuma is commanded to go to the Palace of Earth Spirits and report to the folks there, namely Satori. What the hell just happened right here, right now? While the Arans had split, Koishi notices her hat being obliterated and goes absolutely balls to the wall and insane crazy. After some fighting, Koishi's third eye grows appendages that pierce through Flandia's abdomen and forearms and cuts her hands off. Koishi flows Flandia's limp body through the nearest window and descends besides her. Koishi starts on monologuing how she's a younger sister and that her sister, Satori, loves her. As for Flandia, there was no loved ones beside her regarding the current situation, inflicting heavy psychological damage onto her and ripping one of her wings as a makeshift fishing rod, whilst also aiming for her eyes to use as bait. Good lord. Oh my gosh. Story screams Koishi's name and slaps her, stopping her from what he was about to do. EMOTIONAL DAMAGE! Koishi collapses onto her knees and starts crying. This intricate scene is drawn in much higher detail than the rest of the series so far, to really cement the emotion of the moment. Yeah, this is really the moment Koishi became fucking insane. Anyway, Satori tells her that they are going home. Meanwhile, Koakuma rushes to Flandia, who now doubts her own place in the world after what Koishi had told her about the relationship between her and her sister. She contemplates the possibility that Romilia wasn't here to help Flandia because she's unloved. Koakuma tries to knock that attitude of Flandia immediately. As uh, my good old friend, um, what's his name again? The guy who played James Bond one time? Um, oh, I forgot his name, you know. What, whatever he said, uh, give him a big old slap. Anyway. Following day, Sakuya is overseeing Mei Ling at Iente, who is surprisingly still alive despite everything. Mei Ling whines if she did a job well, the incident with Flandia wouldn't have followed and is concerned of what Flandia thinks of her because of that. Sakuya calms her that Flandia, instead of being mad, cared deeply about Mailing's health even on the brink of death after being thrashed by Koishi. The scene transitions to the Scarlet Devil Mansion, where Flandia rested above to have her hands already regenerated. These guys can regenerate apparently, which is kind of cool. Flandia asks Romilia what she thinks of her. She responds that she loves her for obvious reasons, but that doesn't dig up the seed of doubt that Koishi had planted onto her. As a realization that she was kind of kept in a dungeon for like nearly five centuries it was only good for Amelia herself in the sense that that was a place to dispose her to, so she wouldn't cause any destruction. Because in Flandia's lore, she has the power to destroy like everything, so that paired with childish mentality of her isn't a particularly good synergy. Flandia screams at Romelia to go away. After this casual sisterly banter, Romelia comes to see Koakuma to inform her of a visitor. Satori, who claims to take full responsibility of what had happened yesterday and accepts any punishment given her way, saying that she'll do anything for her sister's sake and emphasizes that this is a natural of her. She just kind of woke up, you know, and felt a little silly goofy. You know, she kind of woke up when it was like, I got extra time to be a hater. Yeah, so she says this is a natural of her, you know, she wouldn't even like hurt a fly, you know. Romelia gets all pissed off with all this nonsense and, with bedridden Flander in mind, grabs her by Satori's clothes and demands her to bring Koishi here. Satori indirectly responds that she had gotten her locked away in the depths of Chiridine, and Romelia gets a flashback on what she had been doing to Flander this entire time, tucking her sister away for convenience sake. 
This part is interesting because it starts with childishly drawn pictures of Toho characters with their bodies terribly mutilated, with the exception of Patchouli of course who is drawn being very happy with a big ol' smile on her face. This series has a lot of foreshadowing intertwined with even the earliest parts, so this will make a lot of sense, granted if you as a viewer aren't like, you know, stage 1 to 5 of Everywhere at the End of Time by the Caretaker, in other words, Dementia, to reflect upon this detail. After the intro, Romelia chats with Remu, the Shrine Maiden and the protagonist of the Toho universe, at her shrine. Romelia discloses that within a matter of moments, it's Flandia's birthday and she's brought her an umbrella so she'll finally be able to go outside and touch grass, as she, as well as Romelia, are vampires. After Remu's interaction with Flandia, way back when Romelia wanted to blot out the sun with the red mist, for those unaware, the events of Toho 6, Romelia observes that Flandia had changed for the better by making relations with Remu's acquaintances, and in hope to make Flandia improve further, she wants to start letting her go outside. This particular scene just highlights the emotional struggle Romelia has to go through, because just as she wanted the best for her sister, it was all taken away from her in one single day. The story continues forth with Satori being grabbed by her shirt that says Female Body Inspector on it. Several shots are given of what is happening, meanwhile with other characters, most importantly, Oku and Orin, Satori's pets, are waiting outside the mansion for Satori. Romelia notices Aya, Gensokyo's news reporter, photographing the drama between the two. So Romelia, in order not to stain her own name, it's a by telling her to get out of her face. Just before going, Satori asks who was the one that brought her to the Scarlet Devil Mansion yesterday. But surely, the mansion's librarian says it was Koakuma. With this in mind, Satori follows that she must cancel the quote unquote contract with her because of Koakuma being apathetic to both Mei Ling and Flandia. Um, Satori can read people's minds, and Koakuma is an assistant summoned by Patchouli, for those unaware. Satori follows up that Patchouli won't believe it until she sees it herself. The asthmatic mage has enough chit chat and gets some grub going by reading her books to injure Satori for pissing her off. After a few attacks exchanged between the two, the hall is fogged with a cloud of dust. I hate dust, it gets everywhere. Hate dust bunnies. Satori sees this as an opportunity to take down Koakuma. Appendages grow out of her third eye aimed at Koakuma but Romelia stops them and punches Satori's mug hard enough to send her flying right through a wall. Like some shit out of like, I don't know, the MCU or something. Immediately after Satori is being rescued by the maids of the mansion, and after Oku sees Satori all bloodied, gets all pissed off and riled up. The fragmented narrative of the series really starts to kick in here. This is a real turning point in the series. The scene changes back to show how Koichi's doing locked up, as shown by her talking with a boot on her head and monologuing with herself. It may not be so well, some real schizo type shit right here ladies and gentlemen. The tone of the part completely changes. She uses her third eye to tear the walls around the Ophida inscribed door in a similar fashion of my food deprived tapeworm living with a light. <laughs> Where the light doesn't dawn upon. Following Koichi's breach containment, many of Kinsyoko inhabitants are shown going batshit insane by killing each other in brutal ways, similarly to how people are killing each other in the first Kingsman movie. And also like that uh, Ultimate Showdown song, this is the ultimate showdown, the ultimate fantasy, good guys, bad guys, and explosions. As far as the eye can see, yeah, yeah you, you get the picture. Wouldn't you know it, we got a cheerful opening, which is the most iconic part of this series. It starts playing, and uh, this is a really big moment compared to the rest of the series, because it's like, you know, nothing really weird happens. But as it progresses, more and more unsettling shit just starts to happen. This intro is actually a remade intro of a uh, 90s anime series whose name I won't even try to pronounce, man. But... Uh, it's not as innocent as it looks either, uh, it has a premise of kind of beating up the Grim Reaper who wants to kill the protagonist. Anyway, following the intro, Koishi, following her escape from the dungeons of the Palace of Earth Spirits, and having a manic monologue about lesbian relationships with her sister, you know, some real incestuous type shit, Yukari Yakumo 
Yokai Sage, Gensokyo's overseer and the champion of 1940's SummerSlam, spawns into the palace. Yukari is disappointed that Koishi is naive enough to think about Satori unconditionally would marry Koishi. Koishi is clueless as to what Yukari is talking about, names to attack her. Yukari, using her ability to create gaps aka portals, cuts off her hand epic style. And just like her hand, the fight gets cut off to show the insanity of certain Gensyoko inhabitants. Ritualistic music starts playing. In the dungeons of the Moria Shrine, Kogasa, a yokai, is shown to be put on a cross, like Jesus himself, with Sanai monologuing about miracles. She asks Kogasa if she's listening, and regardless of Kogasa's answer, Sanai decides it's best to troll her, do a cheeky little bit of tomfoolery, by impaling her ankles! Woo! 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 As Kogasa's lower half of the body became one with Jesus himself, Sanai aims to cut Kogasa's hamstrings. As a last resort self-defense, Kogasa repeats her signature word over and over again until her umbrella pierces Sanai, tickling her nervous cells. The part ends with a Japanese song about, I may be wrong about this, uh, dying, passing away. Um, kicking the bucket, etc. Now, this part kinda like diverges from the original story to uh, provide a little bit of backstory surrounding uh, Sanai. The scenery zooms in on the hospital of the Nagano city, with Sanai's parents discussing what the name of their offspring should be. Ladies of Maria Shrine, Kanako and Suwako, hover just outside of the hospital window and realize that Sanai can actually see them. Suwako, former goddess of the Moria Shrine, gets excited and already fantasizes how she'll mentor her, in non-sexual ways, might I add. After a montage of Sanai growing up, living a double life with her own family and Maria Shrine folk, Sanai is at her home and tells her mum that she'll go study outdoors with a friend. Just before that, an intermission of Sanai being bullied is shown, Various Sanai school items are inscribed with death threats. You know, that whole low tier god clip being like, You should kill yourself. Yeah, just imagine that, but over like everything that Sanai owns. Because of that, Sanai is shown crying in a bathroom, venting to Kanako and Suwako, trying to come up with a reason for what went so wrong in her life. Suwako tries to comfort Sanai by explaining human nature and how she's still loved by her and how she's a miracle on her own to still be here by not giving up. How wholesome. This intimate moment is ruined by bottom lip binding five undecillion snap score thugs pouring a bucket of water over her and her stall. Good lord. She can't get a break now, can she? Poor Sanai, man. Jeez. After the intermission, Sanai is shown as she told her mom studying pain by being ganged up and beaten by the majority of the class. To make matters way worse, after Sanaya was all limp, they aimed to pull her pants off to reveal her pubic hair, but thanks to all astral omnipotencies, snakes started to flood the room and save Sanaya from whatever else was to come. Suwako and Kanako sprout late into the scene like those funny pixies after I digest too many spices. The latter complains that she was able to do more impressive things back at Sanaya's age. Keep this dialogue bit in mind, it's quite important. Scene changes to a playground in which the icons of bravery whom just shat their pants reside in currently to digest to think what the hell just happened back there with Sanai. Despite them contemplating leaving Sanai alone, one of the thugs has an idea and asks others where she lives. The panel dims with only the Zippo remaining in it. You can probably guess well that will... Okay, and then Sanai lost her mother in the process slaughtering everyone whom had been taken in such an act, explaining why she moved to Gensioko. The backstory arc ends, and a melancholic choir starts playing, continuing off with impaled Sanai. She monologues understanding how violence is never the answer, and sees her mother greeting her back home just before closing her eyes and deceasing. It can be derived that the insanity that envelops Sanai amped her personality traits to the brutal maximum. Namely, Sanai taking note how Kanako did not even attempt to comfort Sanai when she was bullied, back when she monologued to Kogasa about miracles. This in turn made her torture Kogasa as a coping mechanism. If Kanako would have been more empathetic back when she was bullied, better yet, stopped it, this probably wouldn't have happened at all because Sanai would still live in the outside world with her mum. 
This in future arcs really emphasized how cruel the insanity that caught up to certain Gensyoko inhabitants is. Minamitsu, a character from Toho UFO, starts a stage performance, hyping up all yokai if they wish to feast upon humans and encouraging them to chant the name of a person whom had allied with them her entire life, Yakuden. After her dramatic landing, she presents that her goal is human extermination, and the capture of the Hakuri shrine maiden, Reimu. Nazarin, another character from Toho UFO, observes Byakuren is acting unnatural by saying all this thingamajig, because Byakuren is literally one of the most peaceful Toho characters of all time. Just as Nazarin went to inform someone about Byakuren being a silly little Sagittarius, she stopped by new. Events transition back to the Yukari and Koishi battle. Koishi, following the loss of her hand, such a tragic loss for a character such as Koishi, am I right? Changes her tone from childish to dead serious, formally introducing herself and threatening to nuke Yukari. She consumes her third eye into the depths of her succulent body and fires a flurry of blue shaded appendages down Yukari's way. Bro thinks she sands. After enough fighting, Yukari got tied up by Koishi's appendages, but she frees herself by cutting all of Koishi's limbs and tells her that because she had closed her heart, giving unto the unconscious, she has nothing. Nada, zilch. Just as she told Flandia the same way back at part 3 the same. Koishi then begs Yukari for her life, because Gensokyo is all that she has. Apathetic to Koishi's words, Yukari decapitates her like a goddamn guillotine back in like the Victorian era or some shit. Anyway, later, in the Scarlet Devil Mansion, Koakuma is with Flandia in her bedroom. Flandia is concerned for her sister because of the noise happening in the mansion's hallway. Koakuma tries to knock that caring attitude off Flandia by reminding her that it was Romelia and her acquaintances who locked her up. As Flandia tries to hush Koakuma, she starts up a literal storm right in Flandia's bedroom to which Flande questions the consequences of climate change happening in it. Kuakuma clears the situation up, given that she earned this nonsensical power which can be compared to a miracle. Giving the viewer thought to chew that Sanai's death is related to Kuakuma gaining powers, Kuakuma tries to further corrupt Flande by mentally cracking her, just like me cracking my head on the pavement as a child, by undoing what sweet words Amelia told her, stating that everyone just waits for the day she'll die. Story continues off outside the mansion where Satori winces for help from Oren and Oku, lying about how Scarlet Devil Mansion inhabitants made up everything about Koishi yesterday, and becomes flowy from Undertale by stating it's kill or be killed. Oku, in the heat of the moment, readies her arm cannon, whereas Patchouli prepares to counterattack after a collaborative effort of creating a circle shaped swimming pool for Romelia and everyone distracted. Oren escorts Satori from the mansion away deep into the woods. When they are close to Chiridin, Satori apologizes to Oren for seemingly no reason for blowing her head off Kirk Cobain style, stating that everyone will join her. Soon. As Oren seen Gensokians wreak chaos across the land, Suwako, one of the Moria Shrine inhabitants, is shown going to the Sanzu River, which is Toho equivalent of Greek mythology river sticks, to bring back Sanai. A short backstory to Satori and Koishi is given, how people were isolating themselves from the sisters because of their abilities to read the human mind. Koishi asks Satori how she can stand this, to which she gets an answer that being open to yourself is the only thing that matters, and she will take care of everything, foreshadowing what's about to come up later. This also can be applied as the reason Koishi had closed her heart and gave into the unconscious. Meanwhile, a flashback to Koakuma's past is shown real quick. And this is when she's playing with dolls and dining at a table with Patchouli, exchanging smiles. You can probably draw analogies for what that was in the part 5 intro. The scene cuts to present time in the plotline with Satori sitting on a throne with her appendages growing out of her in all directions. This implies to the viewer that Satori is tangled into this murder party happening in Ginsokyo. Back to Minamitsu, the airship created to carry out her plans is fully constructed to be operational and is being prepared for launch. A quick intermission is given how Fujiwara, a human with immortality and fire manipulation who saves lost people, is affected by the insanity and grills some humans. 
Just as Fujiwara is charging a firebolt towards her friend, Kain, which opposes her current actions, UFOs start plaguing the sky, shadowing the aflame human village therein. Ah, oh, goddamn, bro, all I gotta say, autism be damned, my boy can grill, woo! The scene shifts to a father and his daughter, who are confronted by a UFO. It's revealed that UFOs utilize razor-sharp tentacles to execute Byakuren's plan. So much for a uh, peaceful guy, am I right? Said tentacles pierce right through both of them, and the child gets aborted 10 years or so too late by said tentacle right into the head. The area is overwhelmed by the sheer number of UFOs flying around the nearby territory and impaling whatever people they see on their way. The plot visits the aftermath caused by Yukari and the Palace of Earth Spirits. As she rhetorically asks for an exit, she is confronted by Rei Sen 2, a Lunar Defense Corps rabbit. As Yukari is about to question Rei Sen 2's presence on Earth, Rei Sen 2 goes absolutely fucking mental for she waited allegedly so long to kill a yokai sage. After a fight between the two, Rei Sen 2 gets slit in half by Yukari's gap. This doesn't stop Rei Sen 2, however, from continuing to attempt to kill Yukari. She mentions about a fox and a cat, which really fits the description of her summoned magic servants, Shikigami. Yukari sweats after hearing this, and after shifting her gaze to the side, is greeted by a terrifying sight of her servant being mutilated to be a binding of Isaac enemy. After rushing to Shikigami Ran, Yukari is only able to hear the words of advice to run. Yukari doesn't assess the situation fast enough, so she kinda experiences a flashbang discord video with headphones on, whatever the hell that means. Racing 2 in the meantime is somehow gluing her body and comes close to Yukari's body. She monologues about the instance of Moonlight Descent Ceremony being complete, and how all this Gensokyo Yukari had created will soon be over. She walks off and leaves Shin, Shikigami of Ran, also mutilated in the same fashion, to completely end Yukari. Goddamn, Yukari chads on Suicide Watch, I guess. I can't help but take note that the song used for this battle is called Dance of the Moon Rabbits from a Japanese horror game, which utilizes its tone perfectly well with the atmosphere of the visuals. Later, Koishi's corpse travels using blue appendages like a spider towards Yukari's body, and by lowering the appendages, merges with her, ending the part with both living as one singular being. Oh my god, now there's UFOs and shit involved. This is like that video where it's like that song and it's got You didn't have to cut me off, and it's got all that crazy like images and shit, yeah. I don't know, uh, I'm gonna take a break real quick, I'm gonna have a wank, be right back. Alright guys, I'm back from my wank, let's get it on, okay! In the Scarlet Devil Mansion, Reimu starts conversation with Kowakuma. Now, as a Shrine Maiden, it's Reimu's duty to solve some incidents, such as this one when Gensokyo inhabitants are killing each other with seemingly no culprit. She states that she's here because of powerful magical energy being generated, one instance being Kowakuma herself, and the other one being in Chiridin, which Yukari left off to investigate. Kowakuma applauds Rimu for figuring this shit out, following that if her fat ass is already too late to resolve anything that had been happening. As Rimu dashes towards Kowakuma to pin her down like Racin too, she also mentions about the Moonlight Descent Ceremony, stating that all will make sense to Rimu tomorrow. And speaking of which, as Reimu shushes Kowakuma, Reisen 2 aims the barrel of his sniper rifle right at Reimus' head. Oh my gosh, literally I can expect some like goddamn, I don't know, John F. Kennedy assassination type shit? Yeah. This is an analogous situation to Yukari, where she was distracted to take out Koishi, who didn't have anything to do with so-called Moonlight Descent, and got killed off. Fortunately for Reimu, she had backup, as Reisen, not second, ambushes Racin 2, injecting some decade-year-old crystal clear Pepsi down her bloodstream, putting Reimu's side at a strategic advantage. The story shifts all of its focus to Star, a fairy affected by the insanity who murdered all of her friends to rid them of a disease. It's, it's given COVID-19 right now. As she was scrying the nearby area, she's confronted by Cerno, an ice fairy who talks a little bit too much, prompting Star to attempt to murder her. After a battle between the two, 
which makes Cerno fly like those Pokemon antagonists deep into the sky. Cerno reassures that she promised to become stronger to protect her friend, Diose. A flashback to the previous night is shown explaining the context behind Cerno's promise. Diose, after starring into the moon, goes fucking ape shit, going off as much as to strangle Cerno whilst complaining about both their internal childish nature. All of this boils down to Cerno defending herself thanks to her fetish of freezing frogs and her friends suddenly returning to normal after sharing the same personality traits as Star in the given moment. To put it short, those who were unfortunate enough to look at the moon became insane. Flashback ends with Star rushing to obliterate Cerno like my mum obliterating my disobedient ass after fucking up the entire kitchen for the third time this week. As girls keep fighting, Star comes into Cerno's melee range, in which Cerno freezes her leg with ice that doesn't melt. Whilst immobile, Star asks Cerno for today's date. This sentence triggers Cerno some peculiar flashbacks from yesterday, causing her to stand dumbfounded. At this moment, Star cuts off her leg and jumps towards her, leaving her decapitated and proclaiming herself as a true adult after slaughtering a child in her career. It's such a Walter White move, Jesus Christ. Dayuse comes to observe this scene, and Cerno, which is apparently still alive, disintegrates Star in a suicide attack to prevent Star with being with Dayuse. This part starts with a recap, cleaning up some details. Uh, for instance, the insanity, or as referred to in this part, the bizarre. It coincides with Koishi breaking from the Palace of Earth Spirits way back at part 5. Oh my god, that is like way back, good lord. But that's just a coincidence of the things certain characters have been doing behind the scenes. The reason why Koishi closed off her eyes explained, for she saw too much sadness into the hearts of others whilst living in the outside world. Despite this, she still could have heard one voice within her, Yukari's. You can see she's really giving into those voices, you know. The voices are growing louder, etc. That's exactly with who the part starts. Koishi is strolling down the woods after leaving the underground, whilst the yokai sage is questioning her further motives. As Koishi claims to be needed somewhere, Yukari prompts Koishi that Gensokyo is on the brink of destruction. With that not being enough of a reason to cooperate, she threats revealing Koishi's true nature to Gensokyo inhabitants, also her IP address, which tilts her over to the sage's side, commanding her to head towards the Scarlet Devil Mansion. As she closes in on it, she contemplates if her presence would be welcomed, for she had done minuscule acts of violence here, as the merge with Yukari's body suddenly made her have a heart and a moral compass. Focus switches back to Rimu's perspective. After the girls have some beef, actually, an entire cow worth of beef, Kawakuma casts a spell card, a signature power move, freeing herself from Rimu and turns invisible. Like she got a splash potion from Minecraft or some shit. Rimu observes the fact that there must have been a yokai who could have done the same, readies her purification rods and proceeds to dice the entire Scarlet Devil Mansion library. As Raisin opts to help Reimu using Raisin 2's sniper rifle, she's blinded by Kokuma, who then makes a remark thanking Reimu for yokai extermination. If it wasn't clear enough, Kokuma has to do something about gaining the powers of others. Okay, so this part right here is a little bit more of an intermission of other character struggles they go about that was caused by the moon-driven insanity. To really tell the viewer that it isn't just Koishi, Reimu and some other characters that have gone kind of schizo. Literally everyone is affected by this to some degree. Uh, for instance, Reimu's acquaintances, Marissa and Alice, are shown flying towards Yakudin's local Mystique carrying airship. On their way there, they're greeted by New, the bitch whom may or may not have made a Shrek reference to Nezrin way back when Yakudin was performing on stage in Part 8. Alice puts it on herself to take her on and lets Marissa venture solo towards the airship. As Alice is pounded by the ground, takes a solid ground pound like some shit on Pornhub by New, and as she was about to give pre mortem villain speech, Mamizo, basically Toho equivalent of the spy from Team Fortress, Team Fortress 2, 2, kicks her into the mug, sending her airborne. She mentions to Alice how the moon was beautiful tonight, to which both state in succession that ne neither of them saw it. How is that even possible? Wow. 
Uh, New gets up and one woman wrestling match leader, Mami Zo locks a new between her thighs which are capable of crushing an infant and after trying to hold a dialogue about mental health problems New had received from playing Leak had received from the moon to no avail, Mami Zo takes a relic arrow and strikes New right by her shoulder which makes New shit her pants metaphorically and then turns into a leaf, possibly indicating New's purification. Story here revisits Suwako and Kogasa, whom had finally approached the Forsaken River Sanzu, which is as dry as my sense of humor and the Sahara Desert combined. Suwako questions her perception of reality and asks the overseers of the river what in that tarnation and damn hell is going on, and gets told that no spirits have shown up since the incident, and that all of them ended up in the Palace of Earth Spirits. In the palace, Satori tells herself how she hates to do that woman's bidding and is unable to do anything else how, rhetorically asking the third eye of Orin for affirmation. So-called woman walks in with her sister, basically. These are so-called Watasuki sisters who are nobles of the moon. Satori immediately hides Orin's third eye behind herself, showing that despite all this mess, bless this mess by the way, she still wants the best for her peers. The purple-haired sister Yorihime notices Satori hiding something behind herself, so she gets sliced by a sword relic held by her. As Oren Satori rolls towards Yorihime, the other sister, Toyohime notes of Satori acting on her own and after some chit chat, Satori acts with the intention of getting Oren's third eye back, but Toyohime had a destructive relic prepared and blew it a smithereens to kingdom come. This breaks the intention she told to Koishi back in part 9's intro where she would take care of everything for their own good. In reality, she wasn't in control of everything in the first place. The scenery shifts to the past, a rainy road at night, where two animals get run over by a vehicle. Blue and Red Satori come forth from beyond the traffic barriers, infesting the corpses of said animals. This presents even earlier Koishi and Satori lore by presenting that they are the last Satori in Japan to this day. The Satori and their respective new bodies wander about, Gazing at the wonders of nature that the world has to offer, observing the beginning of life and human love. Later, a couple is walking with the woman being pregnant before shifting to a slice of life of her after some time had passed. She gets a call from her husband, whom is obviously cheating on her whilst her baby is screeching at the top of its lungs at maximum capacity, putting the eruption of Krokotoa at shame. Following a restless night, she gets handed a divorce paper from her husband, renting how she has changed for the worst. All of these cumulative events were enough to tip over the glass of her metaphorical wine. The woman, in mental shambles, takes the baby for a bath, with the intention of reenacting that one happy tree friends episode with deliberate intention. As the baby was drowned like a, uh, like a baptism that went a little too far, Blue Satori had been overseeing the situation and moved off of the cat body to latch onto the now deceased baby. After drowning her baby, the woman is driving her car to buy a sword to dispose of it and save herself from jail. I feel like there's probably more convenient ways to dispose of a baby. I'm no health professional myself, I don't own an abortion clinic, but that's just me. Anyway, but she's impacted by the Blue Satori's appendages coming out from the baby at a non-zero percentage of speed of light onto her. Attention shifts back to Red Satori, where its mortal body is eating the junk from a local market and is suddenly greeted by Toyohime, whom adventures the Satori about a paradise. She drops to the ground, introducing herself. As Satori bites through her neck, Toyohime just hugs her, going on to rant about the current unjust situation of this planet. Satori is all puzzled. Toyohime introduces Satori a rabbit, with a plan ingrained into its memories, which would explain Toyohime's schizo episode to her. Eventually, Satori does as provided and accepts the plan, as well as a new body from Toyohime's end. Toyohime mentions the need to bring up the birth of a so-called closed eye, which would be the Blue Satori being mentally scarred to the point where she would close it. As the Blue Satori's new body, she borrowed from the woman who was strolling down the street with a dead baby in her hands. She heard everyone's thoughts around her, following with a local news journalist being ethical and not wanting to record the crazed woman in the street. He gets his head separated from the rest of his body by Satori, who mistakes his role 
Meanwhile, some Lunar Rabbits infiltrate a broadcasting station. The stage performance begins with Satori using the cameraman's body to carry out a message to the entire world. Some background information about Satori's species is given. How they can read the heart of someone who is close by. You know, they're real empaths, dude. They could sense that something was wrong with Hitler when his uh, art career didn't pan out. If they aren't in the line of sight, it's more akin to a mosaic. But if there's enough people, the distance goes out of the equation, and the broadcast that had happened in the 80s conducted by Lunarians spread like lice in public transport, expanding the mass of people interacting with the Blue Satori. Following this, the thug who divorced the woman gets his cheating ass mind read by the said Satori, absorbing this negative information and everyone's negative reception adds to the brutality of the experience Blue Satori was undergoing. A policeman in the crowd opts to help, but gets his hand slizzed off by a blue appendage because all voices made the blue Satori go vile and wicked with power and all that. After by furicating the police officer, the nearby people standing in the circle run for their lives, but two unfortunate souls get decapitated. Blue Satori settles to investigate the heads she had gotten and searching for a heart in them. A lunar rabbit runs over her over with a lorry goddamn Jojo Part 3 style, and Toyohime gets her a new body, the one we all know is Koishi. As the crowd was in complete panic, Koishi assesses this quickly by trapping everyone in a sphere of her appendages, collapsing them into a scrumptious meatball. Toyohime approaches Koishi, and using her powers of connecting mountains and sea, transports her to Kensokyo. After Koishi's stunt, Satori asks Toyohime if the Moonlight Descent Ceremony is successful. Everyone will become like her, grow a third eye. Toyohime affirms and shows her a third eye of her own, following with sending her to Skyrim Universe, just like Koishi. The story fills in the gap between Koakuma meeting up with Remu in the Scarlet Devil Mansion and Koakuma trying to mentally crack Flande in their bedroom. As Koakuma progresses her standing of Flandre's mind, Flandre instead thanks her for actually being honest to her, as opposed to others trying to be nice and gaslight her, even when she's destructive and asks to be scolded more like a person who plays Toho for high scores. Koakuma is absolutely baffled, but doesn't miss an opportunity to beat up a child. To be fair, I would actually. Just being real out there. Yeah. Like, uh, like big man Michael Jordan said, fuck them kids, man. Yeah. Events wrap back to the dried out Sanzu River, and Suwako and Kogasa are exchanging some words together. Suwako asks if she holds a grudge to Sanai for what she did, but Kogasa doesn't know how to express herself because Sanai wasn't being herself. Just be yourself, bro. Number one dating tip, apparently. Suwaku notices this and assures Kogasa that this was the only natural way to defend herself in the given moment. Just like Sanai doing the same when her settlement was burned like my crocs I left on the radiator for too long. Suwaku, having deceased Sanai in mind, states that she'll get revenge on the person who did all this to Kensokyo. Meanwhile, in Yante's area, haven't heard that name in a while, where Mei Ling was put to hospitalization in early parts, Kanako finds Eren who is basically Gensokyo's drug dealer from the moon, casting a spell called Detoxification Rain. Eren elaborates that Moonlight Descent is a curse and forbidden act where, after the night of the third, everyone will become a third eye under the condition of global world peace. Following that it all started 40 years ago, full decades, four full decades rather, of Lunarian intervention to re-educate humanity. She had been putting all the accumulating madness onto the moonlight to keep Gensokyo sane, and had managed to drag on the procedure for like three days before the moon turned, causing it to be beyond her control. Thus, she created the reign of detoxification which was supposed to reign for about three days and nights. Its purpose was pretty self-explanatory, to stop the spread of madness but it abruptly stop for reasons that will be revealed momentarily. Back to Flandre after she got her baby teeth finally knocked out, Kawakuma further brainwashes Flandre and brings up how she needs to destroy the Haruke border, which is basically the equivalent of Undertale's barrier keeping two realms separated. In this case, the outside world and Gensokyo for the purpose of quote unquote broadening her worldview. Then what actually happened with Diose and Cerno on the night of October 3rd is presented. Oh my god, that is literally like two days before. That's kind of scary. 
DLC observes how the detoxifying rain ended, and as she put her mug outside the igloo, Kokuma and Reisen 2 had forcibly taken her to have a staring contest with the moon. Spoiler alert, she lost, and as punishment, she had to act like any green haired girl IRL should perform an act of violent tomfoolery. Cheeky bit of trolling once again. After Cerno and Diose find out, thanks to Eren's antidote against the moon's insanity shocked at her neck, she's back to normal. As Toyohime was overseeing this fairy testing ground for their plan, she disposes of the Lunar Rabbit, who shot the antidote towards Diose to leave no witness in command the bitch duo Kuakuma and Reisen to, to rid of the fairies, since they won't remember anything after they respawn tomorrow. Since in Toho Universe, so long as nature exists, they'll spring back to existence. This explains Cerno's peculiar flashback way, way, way back at part 10. On top of that, Toyohime commands Kowakuma to do Slash with the Rain using Sanai's powers in order to preserve as many live Gensokians until the Moonlight Descent is possible. Damn, holy shit, they're just... Bro, they're just doing damage control at this point, I swear to god, man, this is crazy. <laughs> Koishi is zapping and zooming through the vastness in space and observes that she's going towards Earth. As she reaches her hand towards the sign of accepting it, her happiness is circumcised surely after seeing how a giant golden Buddha inhabiting spaceship is accelerating towards her, turning her into a red cloud, gaining down the gibbs of her body down to Japan. Raining, rather. In one of these spaceship statues is a thriving Lunarian civilization with Watatsuki sisters inside of an old-fashioned Japanese building. They report that they'll arrive soon to a so-called forbidden land, a real mystery, Maya. A man who goes by the name of Tsukuyomi, who is the Lord of the Moon, is introduced, silently existing in the shadows. Events make it back up to October 3rd of present year, where a lecture about world peace is being presented. To put it short, thanks to Lunarians visiting the Earth 40 years ago with their spaceship, the world is now devoid of war. All armed conflict has been signed to be abandoned by every country. The girls whom were highlighted in the lecture, Rinko and Maribel, have a chat afterwards, where Rinko is skeptical about this world's global world peace, noting that something of great importance is beyond their scope of perception. This, of course, foreshadows Toyohime's plan. Intertwining with my mention of Toyohime at the United Nation headquarters, which is that big-ass Buddha, she collapses on the ground around the leaders of the world, throwing a theatrical performance from her in to tell them that from Eastern Country, aka Ginsokyo, after the moon rises, quote-unquote aliens will be crawling on the surface of the entire planet. She gives a description that the aliens are beings of nothing but force and hatred to destroy everything in their way to completely sell her point. Later that night, a random guy is observing that moon and tells his father, whom entered his room, that the moon is slowly turning. The father laughs at that statement because he's brainwashed to the point of believing only the information the Lunarians provide. Ooh, spooky. Whoa, we're one day closer to today's date where our events are back to October 4th. Kanako fasts to the Scarlet Devil Mansion just like people fast during Ramadan to inform Reimu what's happening in Gensokyo. Like one of those infographics that you see that um, a woman like shares or something, or the entire planet for that matter. Meanwhile in the mansion, Koishi closes in to the door, and as she's about to knock it, Kuakuma completely obliterates it as she's thrown out by Reimu. As Kuakuma evaluates that her strength isn't enough to take on the Shrine Maiden, she's gonna have to use the power of friendship. A giant Buddha, which is called a Vijoka, flies above the mansion. Kuakuma thanks Yukari for lending to sneak them into Gensokyo, because she didn't notice the events in the outside world. For reference, in Toho lore, Yukari can control boundaries, but surely overhears what the hell Kuakuma was rambling about, and as Kuakuma got all flushed up from Sina, locks her with some magic and abducts her into the Vijolka. Garako arrives to the scene, like a drone strike basically, aimed directly at a kindergarten, and immediately tells Reimu to go to her shrine, whilst also giving the viewer a very, very tasty, juicy, delectable lore detail that actually comes from Toho lore, that if something doesn't exist in the outside world, finds its way to Ginsyoko, something will become war. 
all available girls who are seen, aka hadn't been sitting in social media for 10 hours a day, scrolling through TikTok mindlessly, start flying towards the shrine. They arrive to see Yorihime, who was waiting for them to stop them from destroying the barrier, as destroying the barrier would mean that madness would never enter Gensokyo in the first place. Racing, Luna Rabbit and one of the protagonists, who is with Reimu, tries to be all diplomatic about it, taking note that they're both from the moon, but to no available, sadly. Instead, Yorihime states that everyone in Gensokyo will turn insane regardless of circumstances and taunts, daring them to try her. Raisin takes it further upon herself to talk Yorihime out of that, but Yorihime instead does a Fruit Ninja reference to her, following in a battle which ends up with Reimu being stabbed in the abdomen. Yorihime being smug from his cheap shot that she had landed to Reimu, gets half her face ass blasted by a lightning strike from Gensokyo's god, and gets ass blasted again by Yorihime's Vijoka she had to dispose, eating it, quite literally. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of ass blasts in there, man. It's crazy. As Reimu is greatly injured, Yorihime does some infighting while Remelia and Kanako, who are both left impaled in a grotesque manner, meaning that last ditch to save Gensokyo was kind of just done for, really. They kind of fucked up big time. What follows is a flashback where Reimu had defeated a yokai which had been murdering local people. Yukari hands her some clothes and asks if she wants to become a shrine maiden, amplifying the emotion of a given moment for there was no shrine left to be a maiden of. After the flashback ends, focus goes to the merged body of Yukari and Koishi, who has its third eye be absorbed deep into her body, letting Yukari to take over. She screams for Reimu, but is stopped by imprisoned Kaguya, a lunar princess who tells her to not fight yet. This simple advice Kaguya had given drove Yukari mental. She ripped a stake from the nearby destruction site and aimed straight for Yurahime's heart. Fortunately to Yurahime, the head of the dragon god fell right on top of Yukari, stopping Yukari in her tracks. Kaguya approaches stuck Yukari and gives her the last sample of the cure from insanity that Eren had created. As the sun is about to set, Kaguya Yorihime and the entire Lunar Rabbit army depart from Gensokyo on one of their Vijokas. The sun finally sets and Flandere approaches the Hakure border, which she destroys using her power of annihilation. Following the destruction of the Haruke border, a brief story is shown how a girl and a boy met whilst floating in the vastness of outer space. They spent time together, played, and got more intimate the more they spent said time. After some intercourse, the beginning of all life on Earth started. This is analogous to the proto-Earth and planet Thea collision which had happened about 4.5 billion years ago, that's like half of the population. The girl fell asleep and later woke up to the horrifying sight of third eyes, which can be understood to all humans, flying everywhere around her lover. In shock of what the eyes will do to him, she puts a celestial spell on both of them that will purify him. The Moonlight Descent Ceremony. Following the destruction of the Haruke border, beings which began to be known as invading space kaiju, where kaiju means giant monster in Japanese, infested all places around the world, bringing countless cities to ashes and at least 350 million people dead. Following day, the presence of oni type space kaiju was widely broadcasted on the television. This kaiju was Suika, whom has the power to manipulate object density or in simple terms, size. The human defense forces had readied their tanks, but to no avail, no shells would leave a scratch on her body. As more kaiju are rampaging all across Japan, Japan's prime minister is in shambles on what to do, stating that they must rely on Lunarians. Meanwhile, in Moon Capital Embassy, located in a Vijoka right above the broadcasting tower in one of Japan's cities, Toyohime asks about Koishi, to which she gets a response that she is incapacitated in Germany. In thanks to Tori for making her plans to come to a balloon, and raising Koishi, and mentioning how her name isn't actually like that, just about as she was going to elaborate further, an alarm started playing in the Vijoka, notifying them of Suika's presence. Toyohime tells all Moon Rampant forces on Earth to liberate all kaijus from here on out. A Vijoka gets transported via a so-called dark spot from the moon's surface. An anti-Oni type combat Vijoka is lowered right near the broadcasting needle. 
And after a battle which leaves the Vishoka with half its face and Suika with only one arm, people are shown cheering and rooting for the Lunarians, which is ironic as Suika's true nature was friendly towards humanity, even despite it being in a kaiju form. Of course, humanity didn't really know any better. Suika's head eventually ends up being impaled on top of the broadcasting needle, bringing a kaiju counter at the end of this part down by one. Elsewhere, in Southeast Asia, a large outbreak of insects is being orchestrated by another kaiju, unlike Suika, who is one of a kind to not fully give in to the madness of the moonlight. This one is completely mad with the only goal to destroy, nothing else but. An anti-insect type Vijoka is lowered from another dark spot and the battle goes as expected. Kaiju gets nukied. Later, in the Navy forces, moon rabbits are shown to be a part of the majority of men's lives, ranging as far as having created families with some, working in control panels, and being second in hand to high ranked people. This just shows how deep does the Lunarian scheme go. Following with another kaiju encounter, there's a detail how the Vishokas pilot is being told to settle this shenanigan outside the city, as there were tiny Vishokas, hidden, whom were broadcasting this fight to the world, and any bad reputation towards Vishokas isn't really welcome, considering they waited for at least like 6% of the world's population to just perish. It's poorly heroic, the incredible syndrome-like heroic stunt, explaining why in part 18, Toyohime wanted to keep more of these so-called kaijus. After crushing the kaiju's heart, another kaiju settlement is introduced. Oh god, Brazil. Dude, when Brazil is mentioned, you just know bad shit is gonna happen. This looks a bit more tame for Brazil's standards than usual, even with the circumstances of a kaiju outbreak counted in. And once again, Brazil. After Fujiwara kaiju levels, the city she was in, a Vijoka is lowered, Kaiju actually tricks the Vijoka into hitting itself. Toyohime gives the Vijoka pilot another chance and arms her with an anti-immortality cannon, since in the Toho lore, Fujiwara is immortal after consuming Yeren's funny stuff, after she smokes that Zaza. After giving the viewer some false sense of hope, Kaiju is orbital facepalm cannon to outer space and returns to infancy. Vijoka pilot ends her off with her sniper rifle from the Earth's surface. In the middle of the Pacific Ocean, in a fingertip of a Vijoka, Koakuma is cutting Patchouli's hair, who is strapped to a wheelchair. Patchouli questions the massive amount of power Koakuma has accumulated, by referencing the power of creating many clones of herself gained from Suika, to clean up the freshly cut hair. To which Koakuma responds that she'll be cursed to keep all the dangerous abilities of others within her, so that they will never reincarnate. Lunarians had promised her an eternity with a person she cared the most if she accumulated said powers and helped to destroy the Hakure border. Inside of the Vijoka, Tsukoyomi, the one who was there with the Watatsuki sisters when the Vijoka spaceship arrived to Earth, takes a note of Kokuma's love to Patchouli, and tells one of his servants that the second eye will open soon, continuing of a sin burning love after 4.5 billion years. To put it in other words, the moon will reunite with Earth, that's the entire point of Moonlight Descent. Meanwhile, on top of the EU Moon Embassy located right above the Eiffel Tower, Yorihime's servant claims that 99% of space kaiju have been taken care of, leaving none of them in Europe. Suddenly, a clock lands close to Yorihime. It's revealed that Flandre is still alive and like Suika, Flandre is somewhat conscious and opts to go for Lunarians instead of ordinary people by launching an entire big bend towards Toyohime, just like a true British person would after seeing their favourite English football club get destroyed. Come on England, score some fucking goals! An intermissionary slideshow of all more important character kaiju deaths are shown, namely Yakuren, whose goals were destroyed by the fact that she was nothing more than a part of Toyohime's scheme and Suwako, who died not because of turning into a kaiju and then getting violently raped until the eyes on her hat popped out, but because of Toho Lord details, as in she is a being of faith, and the lack of it fucking murdered her, never bringing her vengeance to fruition. After Flandre travels across the English Channel at supersonic speeds at Yorahime and sets the embassy aflame, Yorahime with few swift hits tears her to bits leaving only the upper half of her body where Yorahime gives her final speech to Flandre, 
Thanks to for giving in to the manipulation of Kowakuma by destroying the Hakude border, and farewells her to death. Yorihime looks upon the counter of a live kaiju's left, to which she observes there's two of them left. Suddenly, an alarm starts yelling an equivalent loudness to some foreigners right outside my flats at 3 in the morning, notifying them of the last kaiju. Moon rabbits take it upon themselves to shoot it down with a railgun, goddamn Halo style, but the kaiju, which is Reimu as revealed by the spell card, redirects it back to the lotus shaped Vijoka, obliterating it. After some fighting between Yorihime, Reimu loses her hand and she was about to be executed. Marissa sweeps in to save her. Marissa, even in a crazed kaiju form, went ahead to save Reimu over killing Yorihime, symbolizing how strong their bond is with how she assessed the situation. Marissa and Reimu then do a coordinated attack to take down Yorihime, and finds to have half her head missing after it. Unfortunately, I fucking cried as both Marissa and Reimu die from the bootleg pencil sharpened Skyder's Minecraft butter coated anchor she was wielding because she was quick enough to react and move accordingly. After the last words exchanged by these protagonists, the kaiju counter hits zero. Luna Rabbits come to inform Toyohime that her sister is dead. She doesn't care and greets the beginning of the Moonlight Descent ceremony. Yes. Toyohime puts the reunion between the moon and the earth above her sister's well-being. Meanwhile at the moon, lunar rabbits explode the shut eyelid of the moon open, following a reunion of celestial bodies. The moon lands with the earth's upper atmosphere and using its appendages, opens the Mariana Trench which reveals the earth's eye. After the reunion of two, all life forms, regardless of what they are, gain a third eye, allowing them to read into the hearts of others. The penultimate part opens with Kaguya, the Lunar Princess, before the point in Toho lore where she was supposed to be taken back to the moon, getting the weight off her chest to Eren by saying that she doesn't wish to return there. Eren proceeds to ask for a strand of her hair to clone her, so there was a scapegoat for the real Kaguya. After this prelude, seven years are shown to have passed after the Moonlight Descent Ceremony. Koishi is strolling through the German winter to get food products to create a scrumptious dish for herself and her gloomy guest, Yukari. As somewhere between the moonlight descent and current times, they had separated. As they dine, she starts talking about how the pig, which was used to create the sausages Koishi cooked, is delicious and in turn had a valuable death. The words set Yukari off like Ran was set off in part 9 and knocks the entirety of the table down to the floor following her walking up to Koishi and punching her, reiterating to how closing off your heart will leave you with nothing. Zero. Nada. Zilch. Koishi doesn't remember that. Actually anything back then for that matter, and looks up for her hat, which was on the floor for advice. Yukari without hesitation tramples it. As Koishi was trying to get Yukari's foot off the hat, she gets her nose reduced to mush. Koishi questions something. She wonders what she had done wrong to receive this punishment, and Yukari proceeds to elaborate how she didn't even do anything. Neither of them did. They didn't do their best to save Gensokyo. Koishi suggests Yukari to close her heart as well, but instead this only makes Yukari more angry and reminds Koishi of her view of Gensokyo, how she stated her love towards it during their encounter in Part 8. This brings forth Koishi a memory of her naming the people she had fun with which she follows that with her heart being open, she can only see sadness. Yukari asserts that it's not because Koishi didn't want to see others' sadness, but rather, she wanted to be treated differently. In a sense, she only thinks for herself, and not for others. After this conversation, Yukari leaves, crying outdoors whilst Koishi takes a shard of a broken plate and attempts to open her third eye. A person by the name of Jean put it nicely in the comments. Lunarians won and there's nothing to be done with it. Koishi does realize that, whilst the yokai sage, who is supposed to be the wisest, doesn't. Despite all the despair and decay that was just laid upon you all, here's the funny part, there's no part 9 out of 9, even if it's been nearly 6 years after part 8 out of 9 has been released. Though that's not the end of everything yet, there's content ranging from least to most crackhead energy having, considering there's a lot of scene fragments with very deep meaning left for interpretation. 
You know, that juicy shit that authors put at the end of their books and shit to keep you guessing. Yeah, it's good, it's great. All things considered, the most likely theory that clearly isn't biased towards the fact that I like it the most is that Sintaku Bune, the creator of the series, intentionally left it at 8 to 9 to throw people off and cause not only a massive emotional pain, but an eternal sense of longing. Just what it was like for Yukari feeling it in the series. Other theory which really isn't that elegant is that the author kind of got burnt out or is clueless with what to write and caught it quits, which isn't really that improbable considering all this media is pretty much dead, lost the time, all that. Final theory I just thought of is that part 9 to 9 is still being made it's going to be as long as the entire trilogy of Lord of the Rings and it'll come out like 7 years after the episode in which Moonlight Descent has happened. So. October 4th, 2023, which is like, oh my god, that's like a year from now, Jesus Christ. It'd be a hell of a surprise, that'd be so cool. Opening up Toho's subreddit reveals a constant stream of garbage which only erects the nipples of the people which probably haven't even set their foot from the closed off island in Madagascar shore. But in it is some, all things considered, pretty interesting stuff to say the least. From all the um, Koichi Komeji's heartthrobbing adventure related threads, it was one prone to be related to creating an ending. Some comments are really creative and aren't just cheap time travel. Uh, for example, Deus Ex Machina or whatever. Shenanies, but between these is a giant golden corn in the turd that is the subreddit. Sushinko and Mobius's continuation series as of writing the script. There were 34 chapters, so if this brief analysis or whatever you may want to call it hooked you up, I strongly recommend giving it a go. That's coming from a dude who doesn't even like lengthy reads. That should speak hyper volumes. Regarding this continuation they have been collaborating on for a bit, for more than like half a year by now. A dude who goes by Drukup has been adapting this to an animation format, so yeah. Uh, look up to that if your mental state isn't completely shattered after consuming all this information. Uh, please scream into the comments if I fucked up some details. Uh, yeah. By the way, if you're wondering, where the hell did the guy go originally? Well, uh, let's just say I've been wearing his skin his whole time. <laughs> anyway, cheers!